I'm your host, Logan, I'm joining three, you're joining me for Titanic, episode 9. I'm awake before the rooster's crow. I barely slept, the events of yesterday haunting every dream. Charlie refuses James's bribe. Matteo and Charlie almost coming to blows. Laney holding back tears when I left her in steerage, forbidden to return. Today, I must set things right. I must try, somehow. A crisp knock pulls me from my haze. Lena barely stirs, so I'm at the door to find the bedroom stewardess. Pardon me, miss. Another monogram for Zeta Surda? Reply from her fiancé, Richard King. I recall what I last wrote to him. I asked Ricky for a secret, and he responded with... He and Zeta had no secrets. But in, I insisted everyone has secrets, even from their most beloved. Your Zeta. Now, Richard's response is cryptic. Time before we met is your secret to keep. Future is ours, Ricky. So, Zeta isn't telling even her fiancé about the missing year? These are personal Marconigrams you're sending? Must be a treat, playing the part of first-class passenger. For a dull moment, it's not as magical as you think. Don't you have a job to do? Not as magical as you think. You imagine it would be so romantic, but it's just complicated. Well, I've got enough complication to worry about. Learning every last nook of the world's grandest little cruise liner. Oh, I almost forgot. Miss Serda's French maid, Sabine. She wants to see you as soon as possible. She mentioned something about a birthday party. Stewardess hurries away while I curse my fate to serve two masters. Zeta in the open and James in the shadows. I start towards first class and soon find myself lost. I wonder until I find the lifts. And there. There I see Charlie looking too big for the little lift uncomfortable in his new uniform. It seems James made good on his threat to have Charlie demoted. Our eyes meet and Charlie stiffens, quickly looking away. Miss Karam, where can I take you today? Are you okay? You seem to be doing all right. Are you really? He says to look me in the eye. Me? I'm just fine, thank you. You'll forgive me if I doubt you. Listen, Adele. Before he can begin, two finely dressed young gentlemen push on to the lift, laughing and joking. I move to a corner as Charlie forces a helpful grin and asks the boys for their floor. It's obvious that he would rather be anywhere else on the ship. When the young men have gone, he turns to me. The officers have me on a short and tight leash, but I'll do what I can for Helene. Worry about yourself for now. You've done enough to help Charlie. I don't want you demoted further. Eleni is a 15-year-old girl all by herself down there. I'm not doing this for you, I'm doing it for her. Charlene assures that no other passengers are approaching, his expression is serious. Is it true, though, what James said? Are you seducing me for access to your sister in steerage? James is a liar. He'll say anything to get what he wants, and when he does get it, or doesn't get it, he's even worse. Charlie takes a minute to consider this and nods. I don't doubt you. I'm not happy about any of it, but I, I didn't think you'd do something like that. Suddenly, the sound of chatter rises up nearby, and Charlie and I look at, at one another and move apart. There's more to say, but now clearly isn't the time. A group of older women in elaborate hats and coats in a lift paying me no mind. I try to get a glimpse of Charlie, but he's swallowed by the little crowd as I step towards Zeta's stateroom. I turn a corner, my thoughts still circling Charlie's words, and I run right into Sabine. Where were you, Adele? I told the stewardess to send you right away. I was speaking, well, never mind. You wanted to talk about the party? None. That is just what I told the stewardess. The real talk is about James. Madame told me about this plan to r ruin the engagement. She loves him too much to see what it is in front of her face, but I believe you. Mm. Oh, thank you. You believe me, but why? Is this a trick? 
Oh, thank you, Sabine. Finally, someone sees you through his lies. We have to find a way to prove his scheme to Zeta. It would take some searching, but uh, we have a way. I stole the key to Monsieur Esler's room. And if we get into his room, we will find whatever that uh, will show Madame that he plans to hurt her. James and Matteo eat breakfast now. The room is empty. This is the perfect time. There are a hundred reasons to say no to protest. But if we find something on James, it'll open a thousand possibilities. We go now. Allons-y. Quietly and very cautiously. All right, we can, but at the slightest noise, I'm running. And we have to put back everything exactly where we found it. Mademoiselle, I am a maid. Do you think I don't know how to snoop without leaving a trace? Good point. We stride down the halls together. I try to get stay relaxed, but I can't deny my nerves. We're stepping into the belly of the beast. Finally, Sabine stops in front of James's door. She produces a key from her apron pocket, and we slide inside. I draw in a breath, the low brass lamps cast a glow on the polished oak walls. Thick oak doors with velvet cushions flank a fireplace painted gold. Sabine wanders to the desk, picks up what looks like a solid pewter inkwell, and sets it back at its place to next to a lamp hung with crystals. He grew poor, you see. Now he has so much. Nice things and education. From nothing to everything. Why work against the woman who gave you everything? He's ruled by fear. Because he's scared of losing everything. So scared he forgets where he came from. Men, nothing more frightening to them than weakness. Fools. I'd say everyone's ruled by fear and weakness. What should we look for? Do you think letters? We oui. look for locked away places, drawers, cabinets, under the bed. Sabine moves from the closet lined with pristine shirts and jackets to the clawfoot end table to the cabinets holding engraved decanters as the lush carpets muffle her footfalls. I look through the papers on the desk, scanning invitations, letters from friends, flirtations. I look for Zeta's name, for sums of money, even for my own name. What do I hope to find? Anyway, I suppose... <laughs> Protection for Zeta. Something shocking, something to convince Zeta to keep James far, far away from her. Suddenly I hear a cry of surprise from across the room. Sabine holds what looks to be a letter. This is a letter from Richard King. Zeta's fiancé writes to James. Well, what does it say? James wrote for more money, it seems, telling Richard how he's a son to Zeta and something like this. And Richard is angry about it. He says no. Says he won't tell Zeta. That is awfully inappropriate. The James should ask, and the things may need to change after the wedding. He must be desperate, explains he why his hatred for Richard. Keep looking for more, explains his hatred for Richard. He's convinced the wedding will leave him bankrupt. This is this must be why. But why not just speak to Madame of his worries? Why scheme behind her back? I'm having the faintest, but maybe there's another explanation here? Sabine sets the letter aside and takes out the drawer from the brass-handled chest. We sift through one stack of letters, then another, aware that time is running short. A word jumps out at me from one of the letters. Balance. It mentions an unpaid balance, and the letter after that does too. I find others. Some are friendly, some make threats. Many mention race t tracks and more. These are the words of gambling men, or rather, the men who control the gambling men. All add up to an enormous debt, I show the letters to Sabine. Oh my, this is no good, Adele. This is very bad. I am certain Zeta doesn't know. But it's good for purposes, our purposes, right? These and Richard's letter, they're evidence. A lightness blooms on Sabine's serious face, and she grins. They are more than enough to show Madame you're right, that James is planning to break her marriage. And maybe they help you too, Adele. As Sabine plucks every reluctant letter she can find from the pile, I crack open the door looking out for any passing people. Only well, you find Matteo standing before me, as wide eyed as I am, his key extended towards the log. Adele, what is this? I quickly shut the door before behind me, hoping he didn't see Sabine over my shoulder. 
But Sabine didn't see him either, and soon she'll have to exit. It's bad enough that I've been caught, but if he knows both of us have been in James's room, how do I distract him for our little crime scheme? Kiss him. Distract him. For 28 diamonds. Woof. That's pricey for a distraction. Try to guide him away. I take his arm and pull, imploring him to follow me down the door, or what on earth? Unhand me, or don't, but at least explain. Swallow, my mouth suddenly very dry, my mind is blank. I, er, suddenly Sabine yanks open the door and steps casually out in the hall as if nothing were amiss. I notice the lamp in her front pocket, or lump, and all the letters to James. Bonjour, Monsieur Vassar. I hope you have a pleasant breakfast. Bonjour, Pazim. You've been busy, I see. Adia glances towards her pocket. Sabine hesitates for a moment, then seems to make her decision. She wanna hide her improper impropriety. We oui. go. Let them tell James nothing of this. Sabine turns on her heels and glides away. Whatever she took, James will notice or he won't. The less I know, the better. What happened to your loyalty? Nah, he's still being loyal, per se. He's always played kind of like the chaotic neutral. Why not work together? If you promise to help me, I can help, or I can tell what you what I know. No, thank you. You've made enough bargains on this ship. James won't be back for some time. I'll make sure you're gone before he returns, but in the meantime, if you please. He gestures towards the door. I re-enter James's grand cabin. And he follows me inside. Regarding yesterday, I owe you an apology. That's a shock. Of all the things I thought you had in mind, an apology was somewhere around last. But you accept? For now, I'm simply trying to understand your baffling behavior. Perhaps I should shed some light on it. James and I are both outsiders in our way. We met at the racetrack, one of the few places in London that I draw all times. I had a streak of wins, but one bookie refused to pay. James stepped in on my behalf. He saw that I had a mind for statistics and knack for languages. My dark skin has never made it easy in London or even in Rome. I had to bet on horses to get more than just uh, my day's brand. But he employed you, and you stayed with him because he got you a better life. I don't do his bidding because I'm desperate. Or because I think he deserves my fealty. I want more. I'm on. I'm the equal of anyone in the upper classes. I want them to see it. I want my abilities, my position, my very self to be undeniable. My life with James offers me a path to that recognition. Who is James, really? Your life with James, what do you mean by that? What does he do besides scheming, that is? Is there a good person in there, somewhere deep down? You focused on James, Mateo, remember that. I can't answer for James. I simply wanted you to know why I remain with James, even if I must compromise my role on occasion. Answers around the room with a raised eyebrow back at me. Like today, for instance, did you and Sabine find what you were looking for? You claimed you didn't want to know. Why do you care? I thought it was the best that you knew very little. I asked if you found something, not what you found. In any case, if your findings resemble what I think they do, take note. A day of speech changes suddenly slower, more open, as if he's inviting me to fill in the gaps in his words. James is a proud man. If his financial situation were to be made public, his problems would multiply considerably. I doubt that he would be swayed from his larger plan to break Zeta's engagement, or even allow you to see your sister. However, if pressed, he might make some small concessions. Anyway, he usually spends mid-morning in the first-class lounge, in case you're interested. After a sly look, Mateo shows me the door. Good I really use my new knowledge of James's death to threaten him. Walk well, for once. Maybe Mateo's right. Maybe I won't be able to trap James as he trapped me, but I could try. 
That's a much needed rest. I admit I like the idea of confronting James, but the thought of actually doing it, it tires me already. Yesterday was more than enough drama for a lifetime. Why court anymore? I return to an empty cap, and grateful Lena is off socializing so I can get some rest. I fall into a dream right away. Narrow New York streets, shaded by tall buildings. Two sharp knocks, and the second time I've been pulled up my bed by that sound today. A steward I don't recognize is at the door, saying Zeta Cerdo wants to see me. I follow him until I notice a steamy taste to the air. The steward points me to an elaborately carved set of doors, the Turkish baths. He directs me toward the changing rooms where I slip into the bathing suit before entering the baths. Adele, over here. Okay, there's a view. That is lounging against the tiles in a silky robe. Her long hair piled up by a gorgeous turban. Her skin is glowing, beads of sweat spread like... Sparkling jewelry across her skin. Welcome to the baths. Perfectly civilized, don't you think? Uh, they look good on you. <laughs> That's her bathing suit. Cute. My goodness, you look very natural lounging here. You're a vision. I can't help but notice the way Zeta's robe falls on her frame. The nuances of her body it reveals. She smiles. Did she catch me staring? Why, thank you, Adele. She pats the chair beside her. I move a velvety pillow and sink it to the low seat like a cradle. I thought we'd just relax and enjoy ourselves a while. But before that, I have a little bit of an unpleasant business. Sabine told me what you found in James's room. Her jaw flexes, those perfectly painted lips tightening before she blows out a breath. The letter is the debts, the exchange with Richard. You told me some nasty things about my nephew, and I didn't want to believe it, but now, well, I'm going to have to face the truth about James. I'm so sorry, Zeta. When someone you love betrays you, well, there's not much worse. Part of me still refuses to admit it. James is my dearest boy. I must think. I must get my thoughts in order. What are you waiting for, exactly? I don't know, Adele. I just don't. Don't look at me like that. I know that you don't have the time I do. I'll come up with something. I always do, don't I? She barely looks at me as she says it, but then she fixes me with a stare, as if to insist that any argument is completely pointless. All I can do now is hope. Confessing to her was the right thing. I should have trusted you, Adele. You survived the interview, the dinner, my tipsy ramblings, and now I see what you're made of. I'm sorry to have misjudged you. Apology accepted. Thank you for saying that. It means everything to have your confidence. Consider it given permanently. Not many can dodge a Zeta when she's tipsy. You're nothing compared to the Soths in the London pubs. Is that a challenge? Anyway, Sabine... Apology, and that's all the unpleasantness out of the way. Are you looking forward to the birthday party tomorrow? Why is the party so important? It'll be uh, executed as plans. I'm dreading it. Executed as planned. Everything will be perfect. Sabine and I are making sure of that. I have no doubt of your professional abilities, Adele. Especially now. I mean... How do you feel? Me? What about you? It's your party. I'll admit I'm not thrilled about turning 40, and don't you dare mutter that number to another soul. But I keep telling myself it's more than a birthday. It's a renaissance, a new chapter in my career and in my life. If I must get old, 
let it be around my dear ones and with excessive amounts of champagne to drink. You're not old, you're still gorgeous. We all have to age. Everything goes old in time. It happens to everyone. And you're no exception, I'm afraid. Not even a little reassurance. You need to spend more time around uh, my flattering friends. They'll all be at the party. Baron, Lawrence, Sabine, James, of course. My little prince, I wish you could have seen him as a boy. Curious, bright, and loving. You know the Baron, of course. Always nice to have a gentleman around to kiss your hand. And Sabine, my little Napoleon. She could read my mind. We've been together for so long. There's Lawrence, too. We're not close, but we understand each other. If things were different, I'd be chasing him for a ring. Not to mention you, Adele. A friend, or maybe more. You ended a deeper relationship. She'll remember that. You may place me somewhere between secretary and soulmate, but I'd like to be closer to the latter. Zeta turns from musing at the ceiling to looking at me, considering. A steward brings two glasses of red wine. Zeta hands one for me. That's enough of that. Let's chat about something fun, shall we? I thought that was something fun. We sip our wine and laugh together at the state of each other's sweaty garments in the tropical air. We gossip and... Mm, talk about home. I tell her about the baths. Remind me of going to the Camden Market and bartering with the vendors. They'd speak in Turkish, not knowing I understood them. When I spit their language right at, back at them, they always got better deals. As we talk, we lean close as if to keep our voices low. At one point, Zeta brushes a strand of damp hair out of my eye. After the steward clears our empty glasses, Zeta sits up from the couch. We stand together. Zeta takes me by the shoulders, offers a light kiss on either cheek, and then thanks for, for stopping by. You want? I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it! I lean in and kiss her on the mouth, bracing myself for any sign that she doesn't want this. But no, the opposite. She leans into the kiss with me, her hands moving from my shoulders down my arms to my hands. Her mouth is soft, her lips salty from a sweat. We pause. Kiss again. A step closer, her chest brush, her tongue meeting mine as we kiss again. Her hands clasping around my wrist. That it pulls me down on the couch where she lies below me. Her hair splayed behind her like a crown. I press my mouth to her damp skin, making a path down the hem of her robe, inch by inch, until I untie the knot that holds it together. Wait, Adele. I'm dying to see you, but I have to... Can I... Reaches for the buttons on my dress. Make her wait a little. I slap her hand away playfully and do uh, the rest myself. Enjoying her eyes on me. I get a thrill of set of skin on mine, so close to the public, so to be discovered. Her touch has had me melting into the heated room, dissolving. We must bite lips and turn our heads to keep the sounds from echoing, pry praying not to draw the steward's attention. As her breathing slows together, Zeta helps me back into my dress and with three ties or row, we stand together. How do you feel? Wonderful. Divine. How could I not feel any other way? It's good to hear you say that. I've wanted that for a long time. I'm... I'm unbelievably happy about this. Under Zeta's startling eyes, a slow smile grows behind it, a hint of sadness. I'll see you tomorrow, then. At the party? See you then. I turn away, but before I can reach the exit, I hear her name. One more thing. I almost forgot. Can you send another more coneogram to my fiancé? Something like, I can't wait to see you, thinking of you, something zappy like that. I've never heard anyone speak of a loved one with such casual exhaustion. I try to imagine Zeta's relationship with the man and fail. Why are you marrying him? It doesn't seem as if your heart is in it. Uh, this is at all. 
Why are you still going through with it? I don't enjoy it, no, but this marriage is a necessary step, Adele. This is a less of a matter of heart and more of business arrangement, and a damn good one, if I may say so myself. I'll make him happy. He'll give me parts in his movies. Simple as that. I moved to respond, but Zeta has thrown herself back on the couch, her eyes closed. The discussion, it appears, is over. I'll leave the baths, wiping sweat away from my brow. So that's why Zeta is engaged to Richard. Her career depends on it. I suddenly feel hollow, mournful for this woman I've come so close to. to. She's resigned herself to a marriage of convenience. She'll never let her true feelings show for someone who she might really love. Someone like me. Outside the cabin, I stop. Something dawns on me, but I can't tell if it's terrible or amazing. I've earned her trust. The knowledge James won is practically mine for the asking. Do I protect myself with the trust? Or do I protect her? The answer will come tomorrow night. It has to. Thank you all for watching. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Head down to the description below, links to social media, Discord, if you like to support me and my content. And speaking of which, would you ever like to play Blue Sex, or, or well, may I say, Titanic on PC? Well, you can. I will include a link down in the comments section below. You can play on Blue Sex just like yours truly. It's uh, very easy to set up. I can always give you a tutorial, or I can uh, basically answer any questions you have. But I will include links in all of the videos. And, uh, hey! consider hitting that bell icon to receive notifications and hitting that join thing on YouTube. It's a great way of supporting the channel and showing your support for me. Thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you on the next video. Peace.